Thank you for joining us. You're watching Real News TV for Monday, August 16, 2010. In financial news, at the Federal Reserve Board meeting last Tuesday there was one dissenting member of the board. Thomas Honing, president of the Kansas City Federal Reserve Bank, unleashed his most pointed criticism yet of the Fed's zero interest rate policy. Honing called low interest rates a dangerous gamble. He also said Bernanke is trying to use monetary policy as a cure-all for every problem faced by the United States today. He warned, keeping rates too low for too long will lead to another severe recession in a few years. Rick Santelli of CNBC explains. I think that the deflation argument is further to further an agenda, and I think this is a good response, and if having discourse and bringing debate to a time where things have gone topsy-turvy with regard to what the government thinks it can and cannot do, what it thinks it can and cannot fix, I think discourse is at the top of the list, and the more we speak about this and the more discourse there is, the better off we are. When has it become a crime to have a differing opinion when it revolves around spending trillions? Millions of dollars of yet uncollected yeah. tax well, revenue. I, well, I need to, if, if we can just clarify that point. Um, the, sure. Let's get on to the idea of whether or not it's dangerous to keep these rates so low for so long. I mean, I liked Honey's comment. He said, I wish free money really was free money. Rick, what do you think? Is there any danger here? Well, I think we just described that. The $1.25 trillion that we have in securities, the $300 billion in treasuries, I don't know where that money came from. To me, there's only one place all money in the U.S. comes from. It comes from taxpayers. Unless the government runs a, an enterprise profitably in the auto side, I'm unaware of, there is no free money. That's correct. Well, let, let me explain the profitability of the Federal Reserve. Having purchased all those mortgage securities, they're going to return over $90 billion to the Treasury this year. Um, and, and the Fed is, is, is a central bank which has the power... Uh, to print money. That's what central banks do. It, it does not lead to an increase in taxes. And, and Mandy, no, I don't think it's dangerous for the Fed right now to keep interest rate rates low or at zero when the threat of, of our, e, our most pressing economic threat is deflation, not inflation. The only way out of a deflation is to reflate. We learned that in the 30s and we learned it in Japan. Which in the he also, 1990s. by the way, Ron says that is not a concern well, he's in, wrong. in his speech today. I would argue that he's wrong. Mm. I mean, Rick, the other, the other issue here, and let me just read you a couple of other lines here, because you say discourse is good. There are other people. Ron has already sort of raised this issue about whether he's got the right read on the economy. He said the recovery is proceeding as many economists earlier this year outlined it would. Many people would say, in fact, that it's not, that it's taken a decided turn for the worse. Mr. Bernanke used the words himself, unusually uncertain. Mr. Greenspan spoke of hitting this invisible wall. Some of Wall Street's own and most respected of economists have taken down their own growth expectations. Yet he goes on to say that GDP is likely to expand at somewhere around 3% rate through the remainder of the year. There are people who say that's just not true. Well, there's people who say a lot, but in the end, I look at the markets, I look at the amount of money we've spent, I look at the long-range deficits we are creating, and I look at the unemployment rate, whether you believe 9.5% or whether you believe 17%. I look towards history. Prior to the creation of the Federal Reserve, there were many recessions and depressions. We always seem to bounce back. The 30s was the first time the government got actively involved in trying to get involved in altering the course of the economy, and if I recall, it lasted all way up to World War II, so get in for a long ride. Well, I mean, that's not historically accurate entirely because uh, prior to the existence of the Federal Reserve, there were institutions like J.P. Morgan after the panic of 1907 that intervened in the market and, and helped to turn the economy. There were periods in the past where there were... Private industry could do whatever it wishes, Ron. I have no problem with that. Well, but that, we, we created the Federal Reserve so that private industry did not bear the responsibility of Who created printing... the Federal Reserve, Ron? The... Well, Congress, Rick, what, what, what is your point about that? Well, you know, read about body Jekyll create... Island. Read about the people that attended that meeting in disguises. It's very interesting. Peter Schiff of Euro Pacific Capital explained how this will affect the market. About a year ago, the Fed was talking about an exit strategy because the Fed had bought up all these securities, mortgages, treasury bonds, and it ballooned up its balance sheet. And a year ago, it was the exit strategy. How is the Fed going to unwind all this and start shrinking the balance sheet? Now, at the time, and you can go back and read, I wrote an article about a year ago in July of 2009 uh, called No uh, Exit for Ben. It's on the Europac website. And I basically called the Fed's bluff. I said they have no exit strategy. It's, it, it's just talk. They have to pretend that they're going to exit. But I knew that there was no way that they could shrink that balance sheet because they couldn't sell all these securities without collapsing all the financials that they bailed out 
and pulling these artificial props out from under the housing market. And now we finally have a year later an official admission that the Fed can't exit, uh, that it's going to hold, it's going to maintain its balance sheet. Now, initially, the markets reacted positively to that statement, but I think now that they've rethought it, the market was kind of expecting the Fed to come up and say, you know, we're going to grow the balance sheet even more. You know, we're going to buy even more uh, treasuries and mortgages. The fact that they're not doing that maybe disappointed the market because the economic news continues to come out weak. The, uh, you know, the housing data that came out today, very weak. It's becoming more and more obvious to people that the recession is resuming. I don't think the Fed is going to stop at just maintaining the balance sheet. I believe they are going to expand it. They are going to start buying because that's all they know. They've got one trick, and that's printing money. And that's the only arrow in their quiver, and they're going to fire it. Of course, they have to pretend that they're not. They don't want to let that, that cat out of the bag. But also the news we got today was the trade deficit exploded. Our trade deficit increased. It almost hit $50 billion on the month. It was the biggest monthly increase in the trade deficit since they began keeping statistics in 1992. Now imagine this. We've got a $50 billion monthly trade deficit with really weak growth, with, with, with a weak economy. Imagine what would happen if the stimulus was successful and Americans went back on a shopping spree. Imagine where the trade deficit would be then. Would it be $75 billion? Would it be $100 billion? I mean, if we just generate more demand, more spending, but we don't have more production, we just run up the trade deficit. You see, what we really need in this economy is to make more stuff. But we can't do any of that with the stimulus, so all we can do is spend the stimulus money on the products that the Chinese make, or the Japanese, or the Germans, and we run up this huge trade deficit. Of course, the trade deficit is going to subtract from the GDP, and you know, so it shows an even weaker economy. In First Amendment news, Judge Andrew Napolitano addressed free speech violations on Fox Business. Freedom of speech, perhaps our most precious and imperiled right as Americans, and speaking out loudly about it. A journalistic pioneer who has pushed the envelope on speech in this nation like no one else has, Geraldo Rivera. Don't, don't obscure he a tragedy to make a cheap political if point. I'm... And another champion of human liberty and free speech, John Stossel. This is the Bill of Rights. I'm really glad America has one of these. Other countries don't. Most other countries don't. And a free speech smackdown. Government censorship versus human liberty. As this show tries to return our nation to these vital principles. That government is best, which governs least. The people are entitled to a government that stays within the confines of the Constitution. The Constitution was written to keep the government off the people's back. Freedom Watch is on every night this week. The revolution continues now. Welcome to the show. We're tackling the topic of free speech tonight, and I'll speak to Geraldo Rivera in just a moment. First, a few quick items from our Freedom File. Anwar al Alaki is the American citizen targeted for assassination by the United States government for his pro al Qaeda sermons. You may not like this guy, you may even hate what he says, but if you believe in free speech, shouldn't lawyers at least be allowed to make arguments in his behalf? The ACLU and the Center for Constitutional Rights think so. The U.S. government, on the other hand, says that special permission must be obtained to represent him because legal work on behalf of al Alaki could be deemed support for terrorism. How are we to know our rights when we're not even allowed to argue for them? The city of St. Louis has been suffering a crime wave, yet found the time to crack down on a guy who painted a giant pro-property rights sign in his building calling for an end to eminent domain abuse. Worse, a U.S. District Court recently upheld the city's decision, a reminder that as long as cities have complex rules such as zoning and signage restrictions at their disposal, they can be deployed to crush inconvenient speech. Now listen to this one. City and state officials sometimes launch criminal investigations into their political critics, especially online critics. Of course, today, an old-fashioned sign in your front yard can still get you in trouble. When a man in Valley Center, Kansas, put a sign in his front yard complaining that the town hadn't made efforts to stop flooding in his neighborhood, he dared end the message with the words, quote, Joel, this means you. City Administrator Joel Pyle had the man charged with illegal defamation, had him handcuffed and kept overnight in jail. Who is this Joel, a dictator? Even in America, free speech can't be taken for granted.